Previously on Space Exploration. Sir, it appears to be an alien attached to an asteroid. Why do I care about that, Svensson? I'm doing my monologue. Sir, there appears to be two life forms on the asteroid. What do you mean, two life forms? I only see the worm. Is that a fish? Sir, abandoned ship. Abandoned ship. Well, crap. Hostile alien planet crash landing recovery kit. Svensson, you're a genius. We've successfully completed step one, build the burner base. We've completed step two, build the base builder. And we've completed step three, build the base. One small step for Zisto kind. One giant step for Zisto. Wow! Ship exploded. Uh, we landed on the satellite. Step two point nine. Okay, penultimate step. Casually just build 30,000 construction robots. Step three. And finally, the moment we've all been waiting for. Step three, and also the easiest step of all. Get the robots to build the base for you.
Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Factorio Space Exploration. This is the last episode of Factorio Space Exploration. One way or another, we are finishing the mod pack. We're going to finish this checklist. So, let's get to it. First thing to do, let's research Deep Space Science Pack 1. Easy peasy. So, back at the checklist, here's the list of things we need to do to finish the mod pack. Looks simple, right? Wrong! It's actually pretty complicated, but actually parts of it are pretty straightforward. There's some things that are pretty complicated, some things that are pretty straightforward. We've got four experiments for each tier of science like before. We put those four experiments into a computer and we get a catalog. That catalog plus some other thematic ingredients gets us the science pack. The science pack is needed for the next science pack. Each tier, four experiments, one catalog, one science pack. For Deep Space Science Pack 1, we've got another one of these guys where we've got to launch a probe from a specific location to get data and then bring it back, which requires, in this instance, a spaceship. I've repurposed the USS Zisto Prize G to be our ferry of science data. It's mostly the same, except I've added these chests here to hold the data and to offload the data when we get back, and I've also added a roboport so that the robots can repair stuff since I won't be going personally on this trip each time. Other than that, it's pretty much the same ship. So like our previous spaceships we wanted to automate, we've got a series of conditions we want to be met before we let the ship take off. There are six in this case, because this is a little bit more complicated. When each condition is met, it passes a green signal. When we get all the green signals, it outputs everything from the input, which includes the launch code and the destination. All that's wired up with red wires, except for the last part, because I don't want it taking off yet. We've got all the inventories of the ship wired up with red wires in one big network. That goes through this clamp and out the other side and into here so that we can read all those signals. The output is wired to this guy, the final decider combinator, and then that goes with an output green wire back through the clamps and then up to the spaceship console to give it the signal to do what we want it to do. So, our signals this time is we want ion stream, that's the reaction mass that the rockets are using to push the thing through space. We need eight space probe rockets and eight interstellar void probes, that's to create the data. Then we want to make sure once it's come back that we've offloaded all of the interstellar void probe data that we brought back. All that's out of the ship and past the belts. So I'm also reading the belts just to make sure that it's all the way out of the system, all the way out of the chest, and there isn't a little bit left in these underground belts here. So we want to make sure zero of that. Then we also want to make sure our ship has enough uranium fuel cells to keep the nuclear running. And then in addition, we're sending some meteor defense installation ammo so that our asteroid field base mining the Nakatite doesn't run out, doesn't get hit by asteroids or meteors or whatever. And I think that just about explains how that's going to work. Here we go. Wire it up. It should disappear. Goodbye. Have a good flight. Bon voyage. So the ship has arrived and the robots have offloaded the probes and the satellites into the silo and it is currently building the first rocket and this part's really straightforward. It just launches the thing and then it gives us the data and then we just take it back. It is really that easy. And there it is, the interstellar void probe data. We just have to do that eight more times. And then once all the criteria is met, once again, the ship will launch from this side. This time we've only got four criteria. We wanna make sure that we've used up all the space probes and all of the satellites, and that we've loaded up all of the interstellar void probe data. And we're using a number just shy of 8,000 because there's going to be a little bit offloaded onto the belt right here, which won't be counted. And then also we wanna make sure, just as a redundancy, that we still have enough uranium fuel cells on the ship to make it all the way back and since we are delivering them here because we've got a nuclear power system we can just resupply the ship on either side of its journey but anyway once all four of those signals are met it'll pass through the signal to launch the spaceship and where to go and that's it that's the whole system the actual recipe and creation of the data is really simple it's just the the setting up and designing of the spaceship that's the complicated part
Boom, and there it is, back from its journey, safe and sound. I didn't mention this first time, but a few extra things. I've added a buffer chest for replacement parts, just in case an asteroid manages to damage the ship. We've got a whole bunch of repair packs in here and construction robots filled up to the brim to make sure that no logistics robots clog this thing up when they deliver new supplies when they resupply the ship. And we're also limiting the amount of water that goes into the tanks so that the system doesn't get backed up. If these pipes fill up with water and the turbines can't get rid of their water, then the whole system just shuts down. So we make sure we never fill the water tanks all the way full. Other than that, it's really simple. It really is that easy. And that is our deep space probe data on the belt getting loaded onto a train. That's a check mark. So the data ends up here where it'll get loaded onto a train and get taken to our science area. Oh yeah, I knew I was forgetting something. We haven't made a deep space science area yet, have we? I got this area down here. We got some roboports all set up. Robots, you know what time it is. So this science area is just like the other science areas. We got a bunch of machines, we got stuff on belts coming out of landing pads, and that stuff's gonna go into machines, other stuff's gonna pop out of machines, yada yada yada. It's pretty simple and straightforward. We gotta turn on all these trains. Here's our recycling rocket uh, part thing. Here is our steel train for recycling barrels. That's contaminated scrap. This is for normal scrap getting compressed into landfill. Then we've got our junk data cards, and then all of our thermo fluid trains. Pop all those guys on. Then we've got our ion stream, and this is a uh, neural gel. Instead of making an entire new production chain for neural gel, we're just gonna steal it from our biological science area. If that becomes a problem later, we can always set up a dedicated area for that one thing. There's our yellow data chips. Here's our white data chips. And then a few extra things. We need to send a train off to pick up that deep space science data we just did. And we're also going to borrow some astronomic data from our astronomic science area. Another production chain that would be annoying to reproduce because at this stage it takes all these different types of data. A few moments later. And the last train we were waiting on just showed up to deliver some neural gel, some advanced neural gel, and then it departed to go get some more. So we're making a lot of odds and ends in this area. The deep space science uses bits and pieces of the other sciences we've made previously. For example, we need to make some quantum phenomenon data, and that is needed to make the quantum processor, which we need to make dynamic emitter. I can't remember all these names, so I gotta look at the machines. And that is going into the nanomaterial. I'll try to do direct insertion as much as possible to reduce putting things on belts. So we're making sulfur right here, which is making sulfuric acid, turning it into batteries. And we're also making vitalic epoxy, which is also goes in here. This thing has six different ingredients. Wow, wacky. And then we're making superconductive cable. If you want to see how it's laid out, boom, there you go. Okay, there's your tutorial. And that cable and the batteries and a secure canister is making magnetic canister. And that's basically just packaging for some blue cotton candy. Kind of looks like the juice boxes, but it's not. It's actually cotton candy. And that's going into here. One of our new sciences, the Naquium Energy Data, uses Naquium ingots. Oh yeah, I forgot. We need Naquium ingots for this science here, the Naquium Energy Data. And we need it here for the Naquium structural data. I don't want to set up yet another cargo rocket for this item because we don't need too much of it. And thankfully, we finally have a different option for sending items in smaller quantities up into space. That's right, we're going to use a spaceship. Isn't that nice? Finally get a spaceship and space exploration in like the last 5% of the playthrough. Wow, pretty cool. So, we've got a spaceship. It operates just like our other spaceships. We have a few conditions. This one is very simple. We just want to make sure it's fueled up and that it's got the ingots we want and then it takes off 
goes up into space, deposits the ingots, turns around, comes back. It's just that easy. And there it is. The spaceship showed up. It's going to drop off the ingots. It's going to turn around and go get more. Until we don't need any more, and then it's just going to sit there and do nothing. What a lazy bum. All right, here's another science thingy we're doing. Nano engineering data. Only requires these things, but look at all of these outputs. Wow, that's crazy. There's some contaminated scrap going out on a belt out to a train where it will eventually get recycled. Wow. Let's see, do we have all of the different pieces here? Looks like we've got Nano Engineering, Naquium Energy, Naquium Structural, and Interstellar Void Probe Data, plus some Cryonite Rods, which is making our first Deep Space Catalog. And that is going, if I can get over here, that's going into the machine to make our first Deep Space Science Pack. Wowzers! Check marks all around! A few minutes later... And we've got some Science Packs sitting in a train. It's time to do some research. So right away, we want to unlock Tier 2. To do that, we need to research the Anaquium Cube, and then after that, we need Antimatter Production, and then Deep Space Catalog 2, followed by Deep Space Science Pack 2. So now that we've got Tier 2 and all its different recipes unlocked, we need to set some new recipes. So we're going to be making Deep Space Science Pack 2 right there. Then right next to it, we'll be making the catalog, the broad deep space catalog. Just down here, we are making use of that astronomic data that we borrowed from our astronomic science area to reproduce some gravitational lensing data, some negative pressure data, and that's making some zero point energy data, and also micro black hole data. All of these we've made previously in our astronomic science area, but it ended up being a little bit easier and more straightforward to just bring this one particular item over and then place down a few machines to recreate these guys instead of trying to bring all of these items over here in individually. Anyway, all these guys go into here, the time-space anomaly data, which has a lot of recycling going on, and for that we are doing our typical method of putting stuff in a box and using a wire to control how much of the new stuff can go in to force the machine to make use of the recycled items. Okay, moving on, just above here we are reproducing a different data. The squiggly data, as I like to call it, otherwise known as entanglement data, is going to go down here into this machine to produce. Uh, which one of these actually needs the squiggly data? That one. One. Boom. Entanglement, I mean. Squiggly, entangle, whatever. Both this guy and the previous guy need these guys, the Naquium Cubes, which we did unlock. They're going to get made here, and they are the primary consumer of our Naquium plate. Naquium Cube right there. Boom, boom, boom. We've also unlocked antimatter production, so let's get that going right here. Antimatter stream made from a particle stream and some thermofluid. That's going to go over here to make some annihilation data. We're going to combine particle stream and antimatter stream to annihilate some matter. Pretty neat. We're going to put that on a computer chip. Right next to it, we're doing triangle data. I mean, hyper lattice data. Definitely not triangles. It is a triangle. Triangles of lattices. Boom. And we are now producing that. And those four data's powers combine to produce the Broad Deep Space Catalog. That's on a belt, that's going to the machine, that's making the Deep Space Science Pack 2. Six more check marks. So at this point, we've reached a pretty significant bottleneck in our system. These Naquium cubes require quite a lot of Naquium plates, and it's currently pretty slow to transport the Naquium ore from the asteroid field because we're using rockets. It takes a long time to refuel, takes a ton of fuel, and our rockets tend to crash or go off course. In addition, the ore only stacks to 10, so each cargo rocket only holds 5,000 ore. So our next goal before we start working towards Deep Space Science Pack 3 is to back up and to research the antimatter reactor and the antimatter engine so we can switch from using cargo rockets to antimatter spaceships many hours later so we're going to research antimatter reactor antimatter engine as well as several new ranks of spaceship space So new engines and new tanks, a new antimatter reactor which operates a lot like a nuclear reactor, just 10 times more powerful, and then a heat exchanger and a steam turbine, also like the nuclear setup, just bigger and more powerful. And now our spaceship can be way bigger. 
All right, maybe it can't be that much bigger, but it can be this much bigger. Here is a shiny new prototype. Let's try out our new spaceship tech and take a test run out to Melancholia. So we are using antimatter. We're loading antimatter canisters into an antimatter reactor. It lasts 50 seconds, generates heat. Heat goes down the pipe, goes into the heat exchanger, which turns water into steam, superheated steam. That goes into a generator and spits out some electricity. It also recondenses into water, which goes out the side, but it doesn't use all of its steam. So we have a little bit of leftover steam for which we are making use of the normal condenser turbines. And that is also spitting out some condensed water out of the top. We combine those two and we recycle them into the water tanks. It goes round in a loop, pretty efficient. 99% of our water gets reused. We are flying through space. We've got how many? We've got 10 different antimatter engines also running on antimatter, just not in little canisters, in a cloud, in a container. Hmm, Fluffy. I wonder if it's cool to the touch like the ion stream. Ooh, ooh, purple. Purple. That's very purple. So, how fast are we going? We're currently going 165. That's pretty good, but I suspect we could probably go a little bit faster than that. So the only way to go faster is to add more engines, right? Last prototype had 10. This guy's got 20. But the problem is, as we add more engines, the size increases at the base. Turns into a big triangle. We need a lot more shields to cover all of this area as it fans out. Also gets a lot harder to get the belts out of the side. There's gotta be a better way. What if we put the extra engines off the side? And what if we did that like six more times? We end up with a big ship. Sort of looks like a, like a tardigrade. All right, let's give this guy a test run. Let's go out to Melancholia. Let's see how it does. Boom! Looks like the engines off the side are only going at 70% or 66% efficiency based on, I guess, how much space is behind them. Might have to try to test that later. We do have some extra hull stress. I don't know if it's going to be better to just add extra engines or to try to get them all to perform at 100%. That last ship was going about 160. How fast is this one going? Already 230! Wow! That's pretty good. And it's still accelerating. The only real downside of putting the engines on the side like this, besides the efficiency issue with not enough space behind them, is that it did get more awkward to get the belts in and out of the ship. These things are five spaces wide, which is the max distance that we can weave the belts underground, which means I had to space the engines out a little bit. Kind of feels like a bit of wasted space, but it does seem like a massive improvement over that last design. Looks like we topped out at 237 on 20 engines. That's pretty good. Oh, direct hit. All right, it appears that our shields are not strong enough. We might need a double layer out here in deep space where the rocks get bigger and much chunkier. Another thing we can do is research some more laser turret damage, which also applies to our shield projectors. We've got about 3000 science sitting here in this cargo wagon. Let's do some research. So after a series of tests and redesigns, we now have a finished, ready-to-go ore freighter sitting in dock, getting fueled up. I researched our laser damage all the way up to 280% for our shield projectors and 650% for our laser turrets. In order to get around the problem with the belts going out sideways and having to space out the engines, we just rotated the thing and have the belts going out the back. Took a few of those engines from the back attach them to the sides. So we went from the original prototype of 10 antimatter engines to now 24, and we've got a mostly double layer of upgraded shields and way more laser turrets. I think this sucker is ready to go. We're gonna ride with it on its initial journey just to make sure everything works right. This time, instead of having two stops, we have three stops, and this is the refueling stop, so it's actually pretty simple, only two signals. Wanna make sure that we have enough antimatter stream and enough antimatter canisters, and then we give it the launch code. Let's go ahead and do that. And away we go. Boom. The engines off to the side are still at 65% efficiency. I'd have to give so much space between them that I'd have to lose an entire set of engines, which maybe makes no difference, but I think this looks cool. I wanted to keep the tardigrade idea, and I've dubbed this thing the USS Super Tardigrade. 24 engines, not all entirely working at 100%, but it goes more than 250 space miles per hour. 
and it holds a whopping 46,000 Nakatite ore, which is more than nine times the amount that a cargo rocket holds. I think that's pretty good. That's gonna be a pretty big improvement. Let's see how much time is left on the clock for this initial leg. Six minutes, not too bad, pretty zippy. We have arrived in Melancholia, the ship automatically docked at the stop where I set up docking clamp, docked to dock number nine. It is loading up the ore through the belts. I've disabled the cargo rocket here and rerouted the belts off to the right and added another ore patch up here. So now we've got two different ore patches. I found that just one loaded too slow, so we added a second one. We've got an eight to eight balancer. We've got eight belts going in. On the other side, we'll have four belts going out. Gonna hold 46,000 ore and then it'll take off as soon as it's done. Well, as soon as it's done and I've given it the command, the go ahead. To do that, we'll have to wire up this last signal. This stop's pretty simple. We just have one condition. Do you have enough ore that the ship is full? If you do, then fine, take off, leave. Next stop, Nalvis, where all the ore gets offloaded and then it's gonna take off, go back to space, fuel back up, and do the whole thing over again. Since we disabled the cargo rockets, there's no landing pads here anymore. Each landing pad originally had four full belts as output, so instead we got four full belts as output for this ship, and it is only going to the top half of the build. The bottom half's gonna need a separate four belts. So we'll have to set up a second ship at some point. This thing should take about four minutes to unload. It takes about six minutes to get to the asteroid field, another six minutes to get back, and then a few minutes to load up at the asteroid field. So it's about 20 minutes per round trip. I've got a little bit of a buffer situation going here, which I'll probably need to expand eventually. I haven't done that yet because I'm not sure where the other ship is going to go, but we will expand that eventually, one thing at a time. Anyway, the ship's ore count has reached zero, and that's the only condition we're looking for at this stop. So let's connect up the last little bit of wire to give it the destination and the launch code. Let's be on our way. So we've got Deep Space Science Tiers 1 and 2 up and running, and we've just improved our Nakatite bottleneck. Next up on the docket, we need to start working towards Deep Space Science Tier 3. And to do that, we have to go after these weird things called Arcospheres. What's an Arcosphere? Well, we'll get to that. They're weird, they're unique, but you can only get them from going into deep space and launching special probes from asteroid fields. So that means we're going to need yet another new ship. Captain's Log, Stardate, the final episode. On the maiden voyage of the USS Zisto Prize H, we are venturing into deep space. Interstellar space. Deep interstellar space to look for some cosmic bowling balls. In order to ensure we don't get lost out here in deep interstellar deep space, I've had the engineers install a large viewfinding window. Convenient. So we've traveled out to the nearest asteroid field in our shiny new ship, the USS Zisto Price H. And what we have to do here is we've got to use some space probe rocket silos to launch some space probe rockets. And inside those guys, we're going to put some Arcosphere collectors and we are going to collect some Arcospheres. Or rather, the robots are going to do it. So after one stop in one asteroid field launching 12 Arcosphere collectors, we collected 40 Arcospheres. These are intergalactic cosmic bowling balls. They're weird and wacky. We'll go over these in a little bit once we get enough of them. There are diminishing returns in how many you can collect in any one location, so we're going to be asteroid field hopping. Next up, Interstellar Grotto. later. So after a few trips, I've got about 170 Arcospheres sitting here in a train ready to go down to the science area. Anytime I visit one of these asteroid fields, it leaves a little icon that I visited it. So I'm using that to keep track of which ones I've been to and which ones we still have to go to. Next up, we're going to do these three and Melancholia obviously already has these icons because that's where our mining operation is and it's time to expand. So while we're out there, we're going to set up some mining and some belts and a place for this new Tardigrade.
tardigrade to land. This is the USS Super Tardigrade 2, and it's going to need its own ore patches to mine from. Here's the extent of our current infrastructure on Melancholia. We've got two different ore patches that we are mining up. The ship docks here in between the two. Over here on the left, we've got some nuclear power. If we zoom out way up here, there are some pretty good ore patches. 8.8, 6.8, and 5 million. We'll start with just these two and create some point for the ship to dock roughly in the middle. We'll also need to make a really simple rail line to deliver some sulfuric acid because we need sulfuric acid to mine up that Nakatite. And all the infrastructure in our asteroid field has been updated. We've got a rail line delivering sulfuric acid. We've got the new ore patches all mined up. We've got a spot for our ship. And then back on Nalvis, we have a spot for the new ship to dock as well to offload the ore it's going to pick up in the asteroid field. I've updated the buffer chest, so there's twice as many. They hold about 2,000 stacks worth of ore. And the same thing up here for the other ship. And now that that's all taken care of, it's time to enable our second super tardigrade by connecting this little wire right here. All right, goodbye. Bon voyage again. Three days later. So, some time has passed, and I have now visited every single asteroid field in the game. Okay, Arcospheres. To get your Arcospheres, you fly around like we just did to all the different asteroid fields, and you launch space probe rockets with Arcosphere collectors in them, and you get these things, interdimensional cosmic bowling balls. You get a lot at first, and then it tapers off. You get less and less over time. But as you might notice, they are blank, and these things are not. So the first thing you'll be doing is you'll be polarizing them into one of those eight values, and this is where the wackiness really starts. You never lose Arcospheres. You always get them back from the recipes you use them in, but the values are always going to be different and a lot of the recipes will flip randomly to give you different outputs. So we've got two different Naquium Tesseract recipes here and they take the same three Arcospheres every time but they're going to output three different Arcospheres and the recipe is just going to flip randomly. You can't just set up a static system, it's going to be continually dynamic. All of our tier three deep space science is also made with Arcospheres. Two Arcospheres in, two different Arcospheres out and these also have recipes that will randomly flip between two different versions so we need a way to balance the arcosphere so we don't end up with only just one and not any of the others and here are all those recipes set into machines we'll also get a few new recipes when we get to tier 4 deep space science the ones on the bottom are the ones with two different values that'll randomly flip to give us different outputs so we've got two for the Tesseract and two for each of the Tier 3 Deep Space Science. We need to come up with a way to keep track of what Arcospheres we have and to change them into the ones we don't have. And to do that, we will be using these eight different folding recipes, two Arcospheres into two different Arcospheres, as well as this inversion recipe, four Arcospheres into the four other Arcospheres and vice versa. But to make this a little bit easier to visualize and to figure things out, I'm going to use constant combinators to make it a little bit easier to look at. Here are the eight different folding recipes. The two on the bottom turn into the two on the top. And then over here are the two inversion recipes. These four turn into these four and backwards, these four turn into those four. So it took me a while to wrap my head around this system and the breakthrough came when I started trying to group multiple of these recipes together in clusters to try to do one thing with them, try to find patterns that repeated through the different recipes. And by the way, we've got eight different values for these Arcospheres. These are all Greek letters. I don't know all the Greek letter names, and I'm not going to try to memorize them, and I don't expect you to do that either. So in keeping with the theme of this series, we're going to give them silly names like Juicebox or Cotton Candy. 
90 or whatever. So this is upside down Y. This is big E. This is upside down 2. This is 0. This is little E. This is cursive Y. This is Y and this is uwu. That's what we're going to call them. That's what they're called. That's now the official names. Anyway, there's eight of them and eight of these 2 to 2 recipes. Each of these recipes has one of those letters represented twice. So upside down Y is in this recipe and in this recipe. Zero is in this recipe and this recipe. Little e is in this recipe and this recipe over here. You get the idea. And I figured out a pattern when I grouped the two recipes together that had a common ingredient. So let's say we have upside down y. We've got this guy and this guy upside down y. We will also need an uwu and a zero to do this recipe. And then we get these four outputs. We get big E, we get zero, we get little E, and we get upside down too. So I thought, okay, are there two recipes that use these four outputs as inputs? And maybe there's some kind of pattern that will reveal itself. So to look for the two recipes, we're going to look for the two recipes of each of these different outputs. So there's the two E's, there's the two zeros, here's the two little E's, there's little E, there's the other little E. And here is upside down two and the other upside down two. And placing all those like that, we can see that there are two exact recipes that use those four outputs. So let me delete these ones that didn't match. So we'll copy this down here, and then we'll copy this one down here, and let's clean up the space a little bit. Let's actually... Drag this down here to have a little bit more room to move. Let's put a light bulb down so we have some light. So we started with these four inputs, two of these upside down Ys. We're going to need this uwu and this zero. And then we get these four outputs. These four outputs will go directly into these four inputs. So this E is going to cross over to this guy. This upside down two is going to go diagonally. This little E goes directly up to here, and this zero has to cross over, and then we end up, well, look, look what we end up with. We end up with two of these cursive Ys, and we've got a zero, and we've got a new woo. Let's actually flip the order here. I think it'll work better if I reverse these two. So let's try it again. We've got the two upside down Ys. We need the uwu and the zero as an additional input, and we end up with these four. The zero goes straight up here to this guy. The big E crosses over diagonally. The little E crosses over diagonally. And then the upside down number two goes straight up here, and then we end up with the two cursive Ys. And we have as output the uwu, which goes right back down here as the input. And then we also have the zero, which goes down here as the input. So the two goes up here, the zero comes back down, the zero goes up here, the uwu goes back down, and then we gotta cross over this little e and this big e, and we have a pattern that repeats. We put in two upside down y's, we get out two cursive y's, and we only need to see the thing with these two reagents, the uwu and the zero, that get flipped back and forth forever. So that seems pretty significant. We can turn this guy into that guy, and we can do it on demand as long as we set up some annoying fiddly circuit condition stuff. All right, you're thinking, but what if this is a fluke? What if this is not an actual pattern? Let's try it again with a different starting point. Let's use these zeros. So we'll bring the zero down here and the other zero recipe. So in this instance, we are inputting these two zeros and we're going to need an upside down Y and a little E as input. And then we end up with these four outputs. Let's find those four starting points as ingredients. The two little E's, the two upside down twos, the two cursive Ys, which is there and there, and the two uwus, there's one uwu. The other uwu is way over there. Once again, we have two recipes that are a match that use those four ingredients. Let's clean up the others. We'll copy this one, and we'll copy that one. Clean that up. Move it down here so we have more room and, of course, a light bulb. And right away I can see we need to change the order because we're looking for this upside down Y to pass back down and this little E to pass back down. So this one needs to be over here. And this one needs to be over here. So we put in two zeros. We add in a reagent that stays in the system, the upside down Y and the little E. And then we pass forward the little E on this one. We pass up the cursive Y on this one, and we got to cross over the uwu that goes from over here to over here. We got to cross over the upside down two, which goes from here to here. And then we end up with these two outputs. We have now turned two zeros into two Ys. That's pretty cool. The upside down Y goes back down here, and the little E goes back down here. The reagents will flip back and forth. We put in two zeros, we get two Ys. 
So it turns out that this pattern is consistent. It does work with every single value of Arcosphere. And so for each Arcosphere, we're going to need a layout like this. This times eight, one for each different type of Arcosphere. We will request a value of Arcosphere to a chest and then insert it into the machine. And then it'll get outputted here when it's done into an actor provider. And that will end up into a storage area somewhere which will get wired up so we can keep track of how many we have of each thing. The different Arcospheres that are bouncing back and forth all have filter inserters and we've got intermediate chests because we got to get the output out of the Arcosphere before it'll accept new inputs. So we need chests in between and for where they need to cross from one side or the other, we are using a little stretch belt there. Our storage, where we're holding all the things, gets wired up to some arithmetic combinators. So basically, we just want to find out if we have more Arcosphere in this instance, more zeros than Ys. And if that value is greater than four, we're going to pass through a green flag to these inserters, which will allow the insertion of the Arcosphere into the machine, which will do the whole operation. It'll turn two zeros into two Ys. So instead of having four more, we should have two of each. So whenever we have too much of one specific Arcosphere, we can turn it into a different one. So that's the first pattern, turning one Arcosphere into another Arcosphere. We need that eight times, one for each Arcosphere type. We can turn this guy, the upside down Y, into this guy, the cursive Y. But let's say our system gets really imbalanced. We end up with just upside down Y. We do know we can turn it into cursive Y, but how do we get the rest? Okay, so the next pattern involves those two guys together. So we're going to grab both up. Oh, okay, auto save. Thanks. I was doing so good. And then you, you just have to interrupt me, don't you? Thanks. Thanks so much. We're going to use the two recipes that involve this guy upside down Y and the two recipes that involve this guy, the cursive Y. So there's one there and the other one is here. Then the cursive Y recipe is here. The other cursive Y recipe is right there. And let's add a light bulb so we can see what we're doing. For this pattern, we're going to be inputting on the bottom pair the upside down Y, and we're going to be inputting on the top pair the cursive Y, and then we're going to take outputs off the side. Actually, I think, yeah, these two at the top need to be in a different order. This is going to be important because we're going to be moving around in a circle. It'll become apparent in a second. Okay, starting over, we have four different recipes. The two on the bottom use the upside down Y. The two on the top use the cursive Y. And then we're going to be outputting on the right two. We're going to be outputting these little E's. And the two on the left are going to be outputting the big E's. So we're going to turn... Upside down Y and cursive Y into little E and big E. We're going to go from two ingredients to four ingredients. And then the other four ingredients used for these four machines are going to be passed around in a circle. This machine here is going to output big E, which is getting outputted. And then the zero is needed as an input in this machine. This machine is going to output little e and upside down 2. The little e is going to get outputted, but the upside down 2 is needed for an input on this machine. You see where this is going? This machine is going to output the normal y and the little e. The little e gets outputted, but the normal y is needed as an input for this machine. This machine is going to output the uwu and the big e. Big e gets outputted. The uwu is needed as an ingredient here. So we've got eight total ingredients for the four machines. Two are inputted here. Two are inputted here. And the other ones are just going to get passed around in a circle. And we're going to output two of these little E's and two of these big E's. And that looks like this when we add actual machines. These are the actual machines with the items getting passed around in a circle. Oh, it looks like I did it in the other order. It's going around clockwise instead of counterclockwise, but it's the same idea. We're going to have to add up some stuff. We need to add up our E's and little E's and our upside down Y's and our cursive Y's and then subtract them from each other to make sure... Do we have more of one than the other? And if that difference is greater than eight, then we pass the same green flag to our inserters, let them insert into the machines, do the operations, and balance out our arcospheres. So in that example, we started with just upside down Y, we turned it into cursive Y, and then we turned that into little E and big E, and those are the ingredients for the inversion recipe, which will let us create the other four arcospheres we're missing. It's really that easy. All 
I am so glad that explanation is over. Let's get back to actually doing stuff and making things. So, first things first, we are going to polarize all of our arcospheres, but we're not going to put them into a logistic system yet. We're going to keep them in these containers until we're ready to make use of them. The train will have to make a few trips anyway, and while we're waiting, I'm going to grab two of each type, and we're going to deposit those into a chest which will be disconnected forever from the circuit network from logistics robots so that if something goes wrong at some point in the future, I don't want to brick my entire save and have everything ruined. We can always use these as a backup recovery method. They're just going to stay there for safekeeping. And then we've got to set up the reagents. So we need four of each type for that. So let's just dig them out of here one at a time. And those have got to go up into these machines where all of our different flipping recipe combinations have been added to our base, to our science area. So for each one of these little groups of machines, I've got a little combinator that tells me where I need to put the reagents. So this one needs the uwu, and this one needs zero. This one needs upside down two, this one needs y, and so on and so forth. So all the arcospheres have been polarized and we're going to add them to the logistics system just by deconstructing these two containers. Robot's going to transport them up there and then I'll replace these guys, although I guess we don't need them anymore because we'll never do any more polarization because I'm not going to get more arcospheres. At least I hope I don't need to. Up here we've got eight different containers, one for each type of arcosphere. It's got a logistics filter for it. Down here are the Naquium Tesseracts getting made. Anytime we've got an arcosphere getting outputted, we just send it to an active provider chest so it goes back to the system. All these containers are hooked up via green wire, and then we've got medium power poles making a little network here, which send that signal out to each of these guys and connect to the different combinators where they're needed so they know how many of each type we have and what operations they need to be doing. Then right here we've got our four different tier three sciences. This guy is space dilation data. This guy is space folding data. This guy is space injection data, and this guy is space warping data. They're going down a belt through the base, all the way down to here, where they get added into the machine and they make the comprehensive deep space catalog that goes over here where we are making Deep Space Science Pack 3. Check mark. One hour later. So with our Deep Space Science Pack 3, we're going to unlock Deep Space Science Pack 4. To get there, we need to do Naquium Processor, and then after that, the Nexus, which we'll be putting on spaceships, and then Deep Space Catalog 4, followed by Deep Space Science Pack 4. So Deep Space Science Tier 4 is just like the other sciences. We've got a science pack here, and we've got another one right there. It takes all that stuff. We've got a catalog, which we can't actually make yet. We'll get to that in a second. We've got four different experiments. We can do this one, the teleportation data. Takes that stuff. We cannot do this one. Doesn't show up in the recipe list. But we can do this one down here, which takes arcospheres. This is another squiggly data. This is called wormhole data. Takes all that stuff. Takes arcospheres and crinite rods and data cards and stuff. Ba-boom. So the reason we can't do this data or the last catalog is because we need to research one extra thing. We need to research the last supercomputer, the deep supercomputer. So this is the fourth and last tier of supercomputer that we have to make, and it's going to get made right here next to the other ones. The deep supercomputer takes Naquium processors, a neural supercomputer, the tier three one, and 1000 advanced neural gel. So our fourth tier of supercomputer requires Naquium processors. I set up a train here. They're getting made in the science area and taken up there where we make more stuff to make more base. The processors and the tesseracts, which they require, are both Arcosphere products. And checking up on our Arcosphere collection, it looks like we have a pretty high number of four of the Arcospheres and a very low number of the other four. And those four that we have a lot of just happen to be the four required for this flipping recipe, four into four other ones. Even with the beacon and modules, this thing still takes about 10 seconds to craft. So I think what we probably need to do is place down a few more of these layouts so we can flip those Arcospheres faster. 
Then we just need to connect up these new layouts with our green circuit wire network that's conveying the information of our collection to the decider combinators and the arithmetic combinators to tell them what to do. And looks like right away they've started flipping more arcospheres. Hopefully that's enough to keep our system balanced. Yep, that's looking much better. That's looking much better. Anyway, we're waiting on Nakatite to make more supercomputer tier 4s, but we did have enough tesseracts to make two of these suckers, so we can set up the remainder of our Deep Space Science Pack 4s. This guy is going to be this thing, the Reality Hypergraph Analysis Data. Cool. And then right over here, we are going to make our last catalog, the Extended Deep Space Catalog. One of the pieces of data we need for this guy is the interstellar travel data. And for that, we're going to need a new spaceship. Two hours later. So the base has made more science and we've got our processors backed up here. It's time to unlock some more stuff. So we need to make a new spaceship to do our last piece of data. It requires a spaceship, but since we've got Deep Space Science Pack 3 now, we can upgrade our spaceship structural integrity by an extra 500. And Deep Space Science Pack 3 is the last threshold for personal upgrades, so we can also do the Thruster Suit 4, and while we're at it, we can do all these other upgrades as well. So we've unlocked a few new personal upgrades. First thing we're gonna craft is a chain of energy shields and each one takes five of the previous. So I just put in the last piece of ingredients we needed for the last shield. We need to cascade all the way down. It's already down here actually. It takes five energy shield ones for Mark II and then five to get to Mark III and five to get to Mark IV and then five to get to Mark V. And finally, that is a lot of ingredients cascading downwards. Energy shield Mark VI. Takes 32,000 bricks, 15,000 of whatever that pink data card is, 40,000 sulfur, 3,000 processing units, 118,000 plastic. Damn, that's a lot of resources. And it's going in my inventory because we got more stuff to craft. The other things we unlocked are life support equipment Mark IV, jetpack equipment Mark IV, and portable fusion reactor, which is an upgrade over our existing RTG Mark II. But the biggie that we unlocked is the last thruster suit. We're gonna go from Mark III to Mark IV. This thing has a 12 by 14 grid, and the new one, the last one, is going to have... Ba-boom, there it is. A 16 by 16 grid. Wow, that's pretty big. That's pretty big. Oh, and a magenta all of a sudden. That's pretty cool, or pink or something. Fuchsia. Let's put in some stuff in our new grid. We're gonna put some fusion reactors, I think something like this. Toss some jetpacks in here like this, I guess. We've got an energy shield Mark VI, which gets us an additional 4,000 hit points. I don't know when I'll need that because I don't fight aliens too much nowadays, but we can fit a whole bunch of personal RoboPort Mark IIs. That is going to be pretty nice. And that is officially the last of the player upgrades we're going to get without doing research into weapon damage or things like that. We also got access to the last of the base upgrades in terms of speed. We can now make the Wide Area Beacon 2, which takes Deep Space Catalog 1 and Naquium Tesseracts and Dynamic Emitters. Kind of expensive, but they're pretty good. They cover the same amount of area as a normal Wide Area Beacon, but they hold five more modules. That's going to make everything about 33% faster across the board. That's a big upgrade. That's a big upgrade. And that upgrade's gonna come in real handy right about now. Because of all of our ships running on antimatter, we are running low on some of our chemical goop, some of our gels, some of our fluids down here, our cotton candies. So we upgrade planner to paste the second beacon, and then we module inserter to add five more modules to every beacon in the base. Okay, so, you see this screen? You see all these items? You see this checklist? You see this machine? We've got just one piece of data left to craft, and then we'll be producing every single data in the game and every single science pack in the game. And we're gonna make that science pack on a spaceship. That's right, we got a big spaceship. We're gonna fly it through space. Our conditions for launch are enough water in our tanks for steam power, enough antimatter stream as reaction mass for our engines, enough antimatter canisters for our antimatter generators. And then when we get back, we want to make sure we have zero interstellar travel data, and we want to take with us 4,800 blank data cards. All right, let's rock.
So our ship now has a total hull stress of 2,999.5 out of 3,000. Really cutting it close there. We are going faster than 233, but it looks like our acceleration is tapering off. This ship is going to need a lot of power because we've got to run this guy, the Nexus. And he's doing this very simple operation. Once we get out of the system and into interstellar space, he's going to convert the blank data cards into the interstellar travel data. But he's going to need a lot of power for that, so we've got four antimatter reactors, which took up a lot of the real estate for our spaceship. I increased the distance from the engines and the rear wing here by quite a bit. It's now 16 tiles, but these guys are still not fully powered. They're at about 77%. This guy's at 99. This guy on the end is at 100. So that's an improvement over the previous designs. But if you want to do multiple rows of antimatter engines, you really have to space them pretty far apart. And here we go. We are nearing interstellar space. The Nexus should activate momentarily. Oh, hey, look, it's another disco ball, and it matches my outfit. Wow, what a coinky dink. And we are now generating the last of the datas, the interstellar travel data. You know what that means. That's a check mark. All right, but we need a lot of this data. Let's get this show on the road. Alright, status report. We are arriving at the Ephemeral Expanse asteroid field in zero seconds now. And we have filled, looks like, a little bit less than half of this container. That's pretty good. We do need to land here so that we can turn around because we need to do a little bit of automation. Very minimal automation. We just need to find somewhere to land that doesn't have anything. Actually, it doesn't matter where we land, but uh, I'd like to land where there's not an asteroid. Confirm, right there. All right, then we need to make a landing clamp right there and then put this guy right next to it. Needs to have the same number, number 23. All of our clamps from this point forward will be prime numbers, I think. Just easier to keep track of which ones we're using. Okay, so that is there. Oh, also, we will need a little bit of automation, and this part will be pretty simple. Let me get out here. And let's try not to... Let's not enable the automation before I'm back on the ship. That would be good. For this ship, all we needed to do is to turn around and go back to our space base because it's generating all this science in interstellar space. This is just a stopping point so we can turn around. So we need the spaceship launch signal and we need the destination. It's going to be a planet orbit. Now this orbit. Automation signal planet orbit 216. Just making sure. Okay, so we tell this guy 216. Do 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 do, and then I get back on the ship. I guess we can trim this up. Doesn't need all this stuff around here. Uh, there's no power going to be here once we're gone, so uh, just leave that one little thing. Get back on the ship. That's important. And then we connect that up with a green wire, and we should be back on our way. Boom! All right. Looks like the return trip is going to take about 23 minutes, and we should fill up most of the rest of this container, and then we can do some science. Okay, status report number two. We have re-entered the Kaleidos system. We have how many antimatter packs left? We started with 150, and we've got 94 left for each of the reactors. That seems pretty good. And the chest with our interstellar travel data is nearly full. That's pretty good. Looks like going to Ephemeral Expanse and back is a good round trip for this science vessel. And as soon as we get back to Nalvis orbit, it should auto-dock and start unloading. And we have arrived. The robots are going to refuel the ship. The pipes will put in some more antimatter stream. When all of these conditions are met, it'll take off on its own. It'll now be fully independent, and we won't need to babysit it. Didn't really need to babysit it the first time. It's just fun to ride the spaceship the first time out. All these guys are going down here to a train where they will get loaded up and sent down to the science area. All right, here it goes. The final data into the machine to make the final catalog. There it goes. Oh, wow, look at that. That is super trippy. We are making the final catalog. Check mark. And we're making the final science pack. And the final check mark. 
That is seriously trippy. It's like I'm falling into space. Sir. Sir. Svensson? Is that you? Yes, sir. Svensson, I thought you were dead. I was never alive, sir. I'm an android. Depends on your definition of life, Ensign. Sir, I've been trapped in space since the explosion. What, you've just been floating out here? Yes, sir. I was adrift until you started building robots. Wait a minute. Are you telling me you were the robots all along? Yes, sir. So all the science areas the robots built? The crash landing recovery kit, sir. Damn it, Svensson. You're a genius. I'm promoting you to Ensign First Class. Thank you, sir. Wow, what a stunning development. So anyway, now that we're making all the things and the checklist is finished, there's just a few things left to do to finish up the mod pack. We've got to research Spaceship Victory, which will give us the victory condition. But in order to do that a little bit easier, we're going to want more spaceship size. We'll do a few ranks of factory spaceship. That means we have to do a lot of science and our bottleneck is still Nakatite. So to get more Nakatite, we need more spaceships. To fuel more spaceships, we need more antimatter. Svensson, get cracking. Sir, yes, sir. Nice job, Svensson. An entirely new antimatter production area up and running. And it looks like the antimatter has already backed up. The pipe goes up this way and it gets stored in some tanks. The tanks are already all full, so I think it's time to add some new spaceships. We already have all the infrastructure we will ever need out on Melancholia, our asteroid field, but it still takes the ships quite a while to get out there and back. So what we're going to do is just make some identical ships that are going to run the same route as our existing ships. And just like that, we've gone from two Nakatite ferries to four Nakatite super tardigrade ferries. We've doubled our Nakatite production. It's really that easy. Sir. What is it, Svensson? Sir, I found another bottleneck. I made a mistake. It turns out material fabricators aren't affected by beacons. You made a mistake? That's it, Svensson. You're demoted. Back to Ensign. Get this crap fixed ASAP. Yes, sir. And that looks much better. Good work, Svensson. Another bottleneck squashed, all in a day's work. So now all we need is to save up a lot of science to do those last few researches. Six hours later. So Spaceship Victory has officially been researched. We got a new spaceship here with a nice, lovely viewfinding window. We can just look right out at space as we fly through it. Pretty cool. We can make a nice big spaceship and we can now set a new recipe. We can set it to distortion drive. It takes one interstellar travel data. It takes 600 seconds to craft. It only works if we're traveling over 250 space miles per hour, and it takes 6 gigawatts of power. But I'm not really satisfied with just having a big ship. I want to have a massive, giant starship. So we're going to save up some more science so we can do some more spaceship research. Several days later. Now that's more like it. I present to you the final starship in the playthrough of Factorio Space Exploration, the USS Zisto Prize Z. I figured, hey, it's the last ship, it's the last episode, it's the last part of the last episode. Let's skip to the last and best letter of the alphabet. It sports a whopping 62 antimatter engines. Let's heat these pipes up, let's blow this popsicle stand. We'll be heading for the farthest asteroid field, Broken Mirror, which should give us enough time to get up to speed and complete our crafting of our distortion drive. By the way, we're rocking a hull stress of 5,999.25 out of 6,000. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. Okay, Ensign, set course, engage. Nice. Goodbye, Nalvis. Goodbye, Kaleidos. Goodbye to all our outposts. Oh, wait a second. Hang on, I just remembered something. Let's take a slight detour. Remember this thing? We found this thing pretty early on when we first came out here looking for Vulcanite, a buried temple with a lot of aliens on the inside, and I was a little bit too weak. They were quite a bit too strong to take care of back then, but 
Things have changed, the shoe is on the other foot, so to speak. And I've got an alternate layout for my super suit. I am a floating lightning god. Let's see how this goes this time, aliens. Unlimited power! Power! Ah, what do we have here? Some kind of triangle circle configuration with a lot of wacky symbols. Sir. Ensign, is that you? Yes, sir. Ensign, do some science stuff. Decipher this crap. Sir, it's the beginning of some type of code. To decipher it, you'll have to find and visit 60 different temples. 60 temples? To get started, sir. To get started? So, we could either take off on our starship and get the hell out of this place, or we can try to decipher this code. Am I really going to try to search out 60 different versions of this stupid temple? No. I don't think I will. Ensign, blast off! Let's get the hell out of here! Set course for Broken Mirror. Exceed 250 space miles per hour. Engage distortion drive. Insert interstellar travel data. Reach interstellar space. It's the final countdown. Power seems to be stable. All cylinders firing. All engines activated and 100% purple. Shield defense is holding. Here are the final bonuses achieved as I warp out of this galactic cluster. We've launched a total of 21,052 cargo rockets, 86% cargo loss modifier, 85% rocket survivability, 96% of our rockets are recovered. Oh yeah, may as well try to finish up this last little bit of research. Let's get those rockets 100% reusable. It's the final 100 seconds. The distortion drive is starting to come online. I can feel reality starting to shear and tear. Wait, what's that? I think I can see something. It's like... bookshelves? Flying past. Yeah, a bunch of bookshelves. Like they're arranged in some fifth dimensional tesseract. No wait, some sort of signal. I'm receiving a signal. It's good. Can't make it out. Too distorted. Wait. It's done. It's becoming clearer. What's it say? It's over now. 